I woke up with, um, uh, to take care of my wife. My wife had a stroke. She's paralyzed on the left. Mm -hmm. And of course, then to go to work. Uh, but um, my son said to me, he said, uh, Dad, there are police in here and they're not leaving. So I, 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 I went down and I said, well, what's the problem? He said, we have a warrant for your arrest. I said, a warrant for my arrest? Mm -hmm. I said, what, what for? He said, Medicaid fraud. I said, Medicaid fraud? I don't even take Medicaid. Welcome to Don't Punish Pain with Claudia. So if you have been following my work as an advocate, you know that I advocate for both pain patients and prescribers. So many, of, so many ask, well, why are doctors continuously in the news? Uh, are doctors still over prescribing? Do we still have pill mills? So my guest today is a Dr. Walter Wren. And Walter, doctor, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Glad you got the beer. I think there's a mistake because on my notes, it says that you're 80 years old, and that's impossible. <laughs> that's correct. I have, I have good genes. My, my mother lived to be 95, my dad 93. Well, God bless. Dr. Wren, I think another doctor contacted, uh, put you and I together. So many doctors reach out to me after this horrible, uh, this nightmare happens to a doctor. One day you're practicing medicine and the next day the federal government is in your office. Now, I know your case is still under, you're still in the middle of a case, so I don't want to jeopardize anything, but you're an internist. That's correct. And you've been practicing for how many years? 42 years. Okay. Have you always been in the Philadelphia area? Yes. Okay. Tell me what happened. Okay. Um, I, um, well, on the 17th of February, I, I woke up with, um, I to take care of my wife. My wife had a stroke. She's paralyzed on the left. Mm -hmm. And of course, then to go to work. Uh, but um, my son said to me, he said, uh, Dad, there are police in here and they're not leaving. So I, I, I went down and I said, well, what's the problem? He said, we have a warrant for your arrest. I said, a warrant for my arrest? Mm -hmm. I said, what, what for? He said, Medicaid fraud. I said, Medicaid fraud? I don't even take Medicaid. You know, so they allowed me. Then they also they said, we understand you have three guns in the house. I said, yes. You know, and they, where are they? You know, so I showed them where my guns were. And they were in a bag. And um, they... Um, let me put my put I put on a scrub suit and a, and a hoodie, mm -hmm. and uh, you know some uh, some, uh, um, some uh, sh sneakers, and they handcuffed me. Uh, the Pine Hill Police really nice, you know. They put me in. A, they said well the car was too small. They put me in a SUV. They took me, processed me, at Pine Hill, and because I was uh, had a warrant in Pennsylvania, I had to be extradited from New Jersey, where I live at. To, Pens to Pennsylvania. Well, unfortunately, that, that meant I, I was in jail for seven days, but the, the horror of it was they had to transport me in a van. Think about a van cut in half, and you're in half of that van. So my knees were, you know, were crushed. I was there in the van for two and a half hours on my way to Camden County Jail. Now, I'm going to, I want to jump in. So you treated pain patients and, yes. and you also prescribed Suboxone. So you uh, you have a lot of compassion and you're a doctor of courage because you were treating both pain and addiction. And when you write scripts for controlled substances, you're under great scrutiny from the government. Now, when the, the police came to your home, was it the DEA, the FBI or the local? Yeah, it looked, it looked like they were DEA agents and there were people from the attorney general's office. I later found out. I didn't, and then the local police. I had no idea, of course. This is a, this is a shock. I'm sure it's a shock to everyone. So I have a general internal medicine practice. Uh, I treated pain patients. I only had 27 patients who I treated for pain because I'd been decreasing my population over the years because of the, you know, the hassle. And then I had to put 275 suboxone patients. All right. So yeah. when you, was it a pain writing scripts? I would imagine there's so much involved just to write a script for an oxycodone or suboxone, doctors tell me it's a constant hassle for doctors to treat, uh, to write any controlled substance. Yeah. Why is it so difficult? So what happened was when this, um, as I would call it a so-called crisis, growing up in inner city, um, you know, I've seen this 
my entire life uh, in the open addiction. But when this crisis came around, uh, they, they started putting a lot of restrictions on doctors. For instance, prior authorization. You have to get a prior authorization and they would only approve the prior authorization for three months unless you had cancer. If you had cancer, they would approve it for a year. So it was a matter of, of uh, but what would happen and it happens to all the physicians, you put in, a, while you're treating a person, you'll send in a prior authorization, they'll reject it. Then you have to call and try and appeal it. And finally, you get a medical director who approves it, but only approved for three months. And then three months later, you have to repeat the same process. So what happened, of course, is they, they, the insurance companies and pharmacies, everybody started doing different things. I, I consider it illegal. Even the prior authorization is, is illegal. So I'm so many doctors, yeah. that prior authorization should be illegal. Yeah, it has to be illegal. But you have to remember that people who are chronic on chronic pain medication is a continuation of therapy, mm -hmm. okay? I had not taken a new patient on uh, opiate pain medication for seven years because I was treating suboxone patients. I felt it was a conflict. It could be looked at as a conflict, you know? And I didn't want to look like I, I was creating my own patient base because, I, you know, I felt that this would be a scrutiny. So, I, you know, I like a lot of physicians think we're dotting our I's and crossing our T's. I examined every patient. I got urines and all the other things. I had contracts, all these things that you have with everybody, but it didn't make an addition. And just to briefly touch on my case, it was a 55-year-old white female that I had treated for more than 22 years. Mm -hmm. um, I saw her on the 1st of March, 2019. Uh, she filled a prescription on the 2nd of March, 2019, and she died on March the 3rd, 2019 at home in a bedroom uh, with my prescription medication I had, oxycodone and morphine sulfate and cocaine and amphetamines in a urine. So mm -hmm. that's how they, they they brought that case together. So Right. Uh, and and you, you did your job. You were vigilant in keeping records, your documentation. You were performing your drug tests. Uh, we have the PDMP. Uh, to the best of your knowledge, this patient was not doctor shopping. And, and so many times doctors are charged when a patient dies, but we have 600,000 dead people from COVID. And I don't see any a nursing home administrators being indicted for the death, the deaths of all the people in the nursing home. However, the same does not apply to doctors. I also want to say, most of the doctors who reach out to me are older. Uh, low-hanging fruit, the DEA uh, targets older physicians, uh, people of color, Indian doctors. Do you think race played a factor in your case? Unfortunately, race plays a factor in most cases. Um, you know, uh, years ago, they were uh, arresting doctors for fraud and abuse. And this is another thing happens. Uh, it was all about the coding. You know, you see a patient and you have to put a code down, you send a bill in. Okay. So if they decided that you didn't spend enough time with the patient for that particular code, say for an intermediate visit or an extended visit, then you would get charged with Medicare fraud and go to jail. 85% of those physicians that went to jail back then were of color. And the other 15% were people who took care of people of color. Mm -hmm. So it's always been a skewed, uh, skewed population in that end. And, and for instance, this particular person, I did MRIs on her neck and her back. She had surgery on her back. Her, she developed foot drop, uh, urinary and bowel incontinence. So, and then of course, increased pain from the back surgery. So she had a, a reason, but if you look at all the cases, it says not for a particular medical reason, et cetera, et cetera. As if, and uh, in particular, this expert examiner examined 34 pages of notes on this patient. Mm -hmm. 34 pages, listen, I treated her for, 22 years. Now, you know, I have at least 300 pages of, of medical records. So all of the conclusions, this particular uh, expert examiner day was based on 33 years, th I mean, 34 pages, which represents five visits mm -hmm. of, of the 22 years. Boy, this is so frustrating. So this poor woman used cocaine, plus the prescription. Yeah. You don't prescribe cocaine. Now, no, of course not. Right. And Oftentimes we see doctors being charged with 
you don't know what's going to happen with a patient once they leave your office. Doctors aren't clairvoyant, but apparently the state medical boards expect doctors to be clairvoyant, which I think, yeah, I think the state medical boards by and large are trying to play like they're not involved with this until you try to get your license back. Oh, no, no, no. The state medical boards work in tandem with the DE. Oh. State medical boards hand off a list of the highest prescribers in the state to the DEA. And you also have that sociopath, Josh Shapiro, in your state, the attorney general. Right, right. Uh, I understand Pennsylvania is number one. For instance, uh, when you look at the criminal complaint for me, you'll see what happened. I don't know whether I, I'm, I'm a physician that prescribed benzodiazepines with Suboxone and also with opiates, you know, and other things, maybe antidepressants, whatever the patient I feel that the patient needs that will help them in the treatment. So according to the criminal complaint, I was the number one prescriber mm -hmm. of benzodiazepines for Keystone first. And that's the same insurance that this, this uh, individual had. And then there's, so, so, uh, so that, that was one thing. And I really think that it may have come from, I also am a person that believed in, in, in 24 milligrams of Suboxone treatment rather than 16, which you don't need a prior authorization for. So I was probably costing Keystone first a little bit of money. Right. And, and, and I don't know where these referrals come from, whether they come from the PNDP, uh, whether they come from uh, uh, the insurance company. And by the way, I did, I wrote a letter to the PNDP months ago mm -hmm. because every month when you, you get your report, it would say, it, it would appear that I'm writing a bad combination medication. Yes. So I can't, I sent a letter to them uh, because I said, this will, this could come back and be used against the physician if he's doing something wrong. And they sent back uh, a letter for me that, that was ahead of them that well, when people die of an overdose, they find a benzo and opiate combination. And I told them that's not a clinical trial. There are no clinical trials of the combination. How do I know that? Because I did a world literature search on it before I ever prescribed it. And, and was, millions have been taking both. For exactly. And I've been writing this prescriptions for 11 years without one adverse, I've never had an adverse event sure. in 11 years. You know, a lot of people with chronic intractable pain, they've suffered so much. And for a person with multiple sclerosis or Lou Gehrig's disease, people need benzodiazepines in conjunction with opioid therapy. But because of the 2016 CDC guidelines, which have been weaponized, uh, patients suffer, doctors suffer. What happened to your patients, your Suboxone patients? Uh, well, unfortunately, I've had two deaths. Oh. Two, of them, two of them died. Uh, one of them, I, I, took, I took care of her mother, sister, uh, her three children. Uh, unfortunately, she was a young lady that would go in and out of treatment or go in and out of prison, but she would immediately call me upon get discharge. And I would treat her. She would never have any money or, or insurance. I, I would treat her for a couple of months, you know, be, so she can get herself together. Because I did get 16 full months out of her once of, of sobriety where she, she stayed compliant. So uh, uh, that, that's unfortunate. Wow. And then none of my pain patients were able to find anybody to write their prescriptions. So some went through withdrawal, uh, you know. They were left uh, homeless. Right. That's, that, exactly. People are left homeless in the medical community and these pain patients, you know, that this is my community, the pain community. They're so they're so desperate right now. Uh, there's so many suicides within the yes. pain community. Once a doctor has been targeted and we receive no airtime, we we only see on the news opioids are bad. Uh, this doctor is bad. This doctor is bad. But. We never get the full story. And with the doctors who have been targeted, if, if you're watching this, think if you have a child and you put your child through college four years, medical school, four years, residency, three years, fellowship, whatever, three years, four years, $400,000, $500,000 of debt. And you really don't start practicing and making money until you're 36. One fell swoop because you continue to treat pain, everything is wiped out. I would imagine that takes a toll on your family. Oh, oh yes, it does. Uh, you can uh, imagine, unfortunately, you know, I have a pretty large family, eight children. Matter of fact, I lost, if you don't, if, uh, I lost my oldest daughter 
2017, October 27th, to mm -hmm. a drug overdose. So, you know, I, I dealt with this problem personally. And then yeah. I was the medical director of two drug centers. And once I was, uh, for five years at the hospital, I was in charge of inpatient detox. So I've been around this for a long period of time. And, uh, you know, it's interesting when you say about stopping medications, but there are studies, the VA study in 2017, if you look at that study, you'll find that when they stopped the medication of the veterans, immediately 57.26% of them uh, died of a drug overdose and 30% of them committed suicide. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the Annals of Internal Medicine, June 5th, 2019 issue, they, they say misapplication of the CDC guidelines. Yeah. And it showed that people on high doses of opiates and long-term therapy with opiate medication are not covered by the CC, CDC guidelines. So they put in a correction. It's in the annals of internal medicine, but it doesn't make a difference when you get to court. You know, the facts don't matter. It's not even a matter of fact. No, fact, and, and doctors simply don't have due process. You know, a lot of people ask me, uh, is this happening to the pain community because of something Trump did or something Biden is doing? The electronic health record system that was created under the Obama administration. Right. Uh, during that time, I would imagine doctors, I know I had a doctor who almost had a breakdown because of the electronic health record system. She found it very confusing. Do you think this with this problem will continue to worsen if we don't have those 2016 CDC guidelines rescinded? Uh, oh, absolutely. But you have to remember that, that this MMEs, all these things are arbitrary, right. made up phenomena. And, and, MME. Your, 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 and your patient doesn't ask for M MME. Patient asks for pain relief. Absolutely. And every patient is an individual, just like anybody else you treat. The high blood pressure, diabetes, everyone is an individual. Right. And, and you treat the person based upon the best no medical knowledge that you have to help the patient. Yes. You know, for whatever condition you're treating them for. Instead, the government has taken this cookie cutter approach where everybody can only receive a certain amount of medication if you go above that medication. And, and pain patients are treated like parolees. I'm surprised we have doctors who are even writing scripts for controlled substances. It, it's so scary. I know the DEA raids doctors. Uh, they sequester you from your loved one. Sometimes they're in the office for, t for 12 hours. They come in with guns and SWAT gear. Uh, and most people don't know this is happening. Those 2016 CDC guidelines, uh, they were released under the uh, Trump administration. Right. And uh, those were created with the help of paid anti-opioid consultants, the organization PROP. These are people who are, they work together with the lawyers involved in the opioid litigation, because that's all we see on the news, right? About the opioid litigation. So what the government has done, they've taken out the doctor, they've left the pain, uh, and if the pain patient or the person who is using Suboxone mm -hmm. is fortunate to find a doctor, then the pharmacy probably won't fill it. But if and the pharmacy does fill it, chances are the insurance carrier will not cover it. Right. So this was a well thought out plan. They have, they have figured out every way to eliminate the person with pain, but we're still here. Now we're hearing more about Suboxone doctors getting raided and we're in the right. middle of this overdosing epidemic. And, and, I need, and, and I need to warn anyone who's thinking about taking Suboxone patient. You know, under the Trump administration, right before he went out of office, he said that any practitioner without a waiver could, could prescribe Suboxone. Right. And then of course, Biden held that initially, but then he allowed that to happen. So right now, any physician can write for some box and up to 30 patients without a waiver, mm -hmm. okay? But if you look at all the things that they charge people with, sure. okay, so what happens? You do the urine, right? Okay, you did the urine. The urine comes back and it has the drugs in it, some box and whatever, that's fine. Then the urine comes back, but it doesn't have some box in it, but it has another drug in it. Or, you know, or it has illegal drug. What did you do about that? Right. They get to get people on that. Then, then say, for instance, you're given a benzodiazepine or even Suboxone. You know, you can refill those prescriptions. Mm -hmm. So if you don't refill them, you made the person come back so you can make money. If you refill them, 
then what you did was you ignored, you didn't monitor the person. Sure. So you're, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. You don't. Right. Now, with these urine drug screens for the for the viewers, a patient, uh, a lot, most patients I know who go to pain management have to get, give a urine drug test every four weeks. These are also pre prone to human error, but we're learning that if a doctor does not discharge a patient who failed their urine drug test because the doctor has compassion, then if the DEA raids you, that will be used against you in a court of law. Well, doctor, why didn't you discharge this patient? There was no medication in their system. So right. virtually, there's no, nobody, had, you're not prescribing anymore. You're not treating your patient's pain. The government is treating, is doing all the treatment for you. Right. It's all, the, the doctor-patient relationship has been obliterated because of the government. Now, you had sent me an email not too long ago. Mm -hmm. This is for doctors who are watching this. Uh, you said, see and examine patients personally. If you use right. a nurse practitioner or a physician right. assistant, see patient prior to signing off and writing a script because we see doctors getting sent to prison for not right. doing this. Put the right. patient's diagnosis on the prescription. Make sure no one in your office can access your e-prescribing. If you still use paper prescriptions, have them numbered, keep them under lock and key. Get an EHR system that automatically checks prescriptions filled by your patients. And this list, this list goes on and on. One, another uh, bullet point, urine drug screen on every patient receiving opiate pain medication review and report records. Uh, verify any and all medical information. This list is exhausting. Now, I think you gave me 25, 25 bullet points. Who yes. the hell in their right mind would want to treat pain or addiction in this climate? I mean, I've just gone through menopause reading this list. <laughs> yes, what happened was when, when I, of course, got arrested, I found out that I wasn't alone. <laughs> if you, and I saw your organization, I was direct to your organization right away. And I've, of course, been reviewing cases around the country. And in reviewing those cases, that's what made me prompt this list. And what I'm trying to do with this list is to expand it, put it out there, have people add to it. Because if you're going you have to, you know, you're not, you're, you still may get arrested, but you may have all your things in order, documentation specifically. Yeah. But yeah. if you have, when you get these people to sign contracts, you write it into your policy that you believe that opioid addiction is a, is a chronic disease that needs treated lifetime treatment, just like diabetes or high blood pressure. And then you write your 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 policy into that that so it's already written down that you're not going to kick a person out if the person comes in, you're going to do this or do that. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you do a pill count, you always you put that down, you document everything. So everything needs to be documented. And remember, unfortunately, in one one case, the person gets gets arrested for this, the other case he gets arrested for that because he did this. So you, you, you're not going to be perfect, but the more you can adhere to certain guidelines, the less likely you are to be, uh, uh, at least them have something that they, that they can use against you. Right. So right. That, that's what I'm looking at. So it, it, we have doctors who do everything correct, but right. you got to always be a high prescriber. There's always one. Right. That's, all, that's right. And, and your patients, they were they were left homeless. Now, another doctor, it's going to be difficult for them to inherit your patients because now they're going to be the high prescriber. Not, not only that was interesting. I referred my patients to remember I told you I have most people on 24 milligrams and I do a, do a combination with a benzo on, on a lot of occasions. So when I referred him to another doctor, he started, maybe started reducing them because remember, in Pennsylvania, 16 milligrams you can get without a per authorization. If you go above 16 milligrams, you get a do per authorization. Most physicians aren't going to do that. My patients, in order for them to get 24 milligrams, I had to do per authorizations for them. Right. Okay. Let's, and, let's talk about Suboxone for addiction for okay, the viewers. Sure. So Suboxone, it, it's an opiate. It's a medication. Yes. It's, and, it's a combination. The combination opiate with a block. Okay. So it, greatest, it's the greatest, the greatest thing since sliced bread. I hear that from doctors all the time. It's a wonderful medication. I advocate for many people who struggle with addiction. Uh, a lot of heroin users tell me that it's given them their life back. Exactly. And we have to stop 
this, we have to slow the overdosing. See this, the, our government has created uh, a manufactured opioid crisis. We've got people overdosing at alarming rates on illicit fentanyl, not on hospital grade fentanyl. Overdose mm -hmm. by 1,042%, prescribing is the lowest it's been in 20 years. And now doctors are afraid to prescribe the Suboxone. So the government created this crisis. The government has, we have this tool to solve the crisis, but now doctors are afraid to use the tool because they don't right. trust the government. Yeah, exactly. And see what happens. You have some doctors because of this. Uh, now, I, I, I treat patients in more than one state. So I have people with the same insurance company in Pennsylvania, which only lets you get 16 milligrams out of prior authorization. And in New Jersey, you can get 24 without a prior authorization. OK, so Jersey, by the way, is a little more lenient than Pennsylvania. But anyway, so um, uh, with the original studies that were done, with, I've been doing this for like 11 years. So the original studies with Suboxone was done on approval for 24 milligrams. OK, now they only have one study. Unfortunately, it was only on eight patients. But they found that if a person took 16 milligrams of Suboxone a day, 92 percent of the opiate receptors were, satur were saturated. If they took 24 milligrams, 96% of the opiate receptors were. That's so a good thing. dose is better, right. That's a good and thing it, because it, it's, it's a, they're not having those cravings. Right, exactly. Right, so we're stopping the cravings. Their receptors are filled. They're not right. going to overdose like they would. Uh, right. But there are, there are overdoses for viewers. People have overdosed on buprenorphine. Well, I'd, I'd, have, I'd, have, I'd have to question that because, you know, buprenorphine has a ceiling effect. Mm-hmm. You can't give too much. You can give not enough. And that's what that's why people relapse. They're not getting enough medication, you yeah. know, to, cut, to, to prevent cravings. Now, when you look at the subject cane injectable uh, medication that they came up with, injectable for morphine, in that study, they showed that that they took twice the plasma level to prevent cravings as to prevent withdrawal. So you know, cravings is why people relapse. So that's what you want to give enough to prevent the cravings. Sure. Okay. You see what I mean? So the thing is, there's data out there if no one pays attention to it. Yeah. No, <laughs> right. We, we're supposed to follow the science. The government doesn't follow the science. No. You know, I would like to say that the morphine milligram equivalent, the MMA, that was created on, that was an arbitrary number that <laughs> it was probably a round table discussion. And one of the psychiatrists said, I know we're going to have a 90 MME and nobody can receive any more medication than that. Now this was strictly guidance, but the CDC guidelines have been turned into laws, regulations, and that's right. why the government, the DEA, the FBI, the AGs, they're using that to arrest doctors. We must, we must rescind the 2016 CDC guidelines. You know, I'm watching people be turned away uh, with acute pain. I just advocated for somebody who had a broken femur and they were sent home from the emergency room with Tylenol and ibuprofen and, and a doctor's like, well, studies show. I said, no, 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 no such study exists <laughs> where it says a broken femur will do just as, just well with ibuprofen and Tylenol. I said, show me the study, show me the study. But these doctors don't even know what studies mm. doctors are. There, is, there isn't any. See, the thing is that you can't do any kind of uh, study they may have a negative outcome. That's right. That's right. You can't do a study like that. So I was, a, by the way, I was a researcher for five years in cardiovascular pharmacology before I went to medical school. So I'm aware of you know getting drugs approved and how they get approved. Uh, but the thing is that we we don't we, we science is not even in the courtroom. As I mentioned, it's the the CDC put out guidelines in the Annals of Internal Medicine in in June fifth, 2019 to warn against the misapplication of the CDC guidelines. Yes, yes. That chronic people in chronic pain did not, that didn't adhere to them. So this 90 MME doesn't even apply to the persons that all of us got have gotten arrested for treating. Sure. They're chronic, they're chronic pain patients, they're on high doses of opiate, opiate pain medication, just be, that's because how, that's how the medication works. Sure. Over time, you need more because the liver detoxifies, it's smarter. So you, you have to get a steady state in order to eliminate the pain. Just like you would if you were a diabetic. With exactly, insulin. exactly. And, you know, we've heard so many, I know when I, before I was able to get legislation up and running in my state, I met with the department, you know, the head of the Department of Labor. And she said, well, it would be cruel if we took someone's insulin away. I said, but you did take someone's insulin away, but you took it in, in the form of pain medication. 
you all knew this was going to happen, but you, but the government moved forward. And from where I'm sitting, I see a whole lot of people profiting off of this fake <laughs> opioid crisis. Now, now, let me tell you, this is this is this is a truth. You don't need a lot of opioid medication to become addicted. You can take one percent. That's it. You're addicted. Mm-hmm. If it hits the new receptor, you get a euphoric with that. With that. Uh, with the, as a, that's the result when you take it. You now become addicted. It has nothing to do with taking it over time or the quantity. Now that's that's something that people need to need to realize. Everyone thinks, oh, it's because they had so many. No, they were addicted on one. Now let me ask you: Do you believe addiction is genetic, or do socioeconomic factors come into play? People who live in in impoverished impoverished neighborhoods, why are people why do people become addicted? I I, I wish I could ask that question. I, I might I could have just write a paper on it. Uh, one thing is uh, how the medication works. Neither the prescription doctor who prescribes it nor the pharmaceutical company that makes it is responsible for the addiction. It is the way the drug works. It's an opiate that breaks down into its active ingredients. It goes to the opiate receptors in the brain. We now have identified, identified three of them, okay? And when it goes away from the opiate receptors, you get withdrawal, you know? Say, let's look at the GI tract, which has new receptors. If you take an opiate, you get constipated. When you go through withdrawal, you get diarrhea. That's the same thing as working in your brain and other parts of your body. Okay. Because it's a receptor-driven entity of which you have no control or what else. Now, is that addiction hereditary? That's a good question. You know, and is it genomic? We don't know. They're doing studies now at Howard University in, 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 my, to see whether, in the genomic department to see whether or not they can find a predisposition in the genomic structure. Right. Um, they don't. They 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 don't. They haven't come up with anything yet. But they're investigating. Science is investigating certain things, but doctors are getting arrested for just doing a normal practice in medicine. That's the that's the. And then patients are being deprived of pain medication that allows them to function. Let me tell you what I when I learned about pain medication. I had an older lady, and I was giving her sixty Percocet five a month. And I was cautioning her one day about addiction. She said, Dr. Wren, when I take this medication, I can go up and down the steps and take care of my parents. Mm -hmm. That's when I realized about what we never ever were taught in medical school or never learned. It's called the medication improving your activities of daily living. Sure. Allows you to go to work when you have injuries and pain, allows you to function because remember pain allows you to do things that you couldn't do if, pain, if you didn't have pain medication. Yeah. So it serves, serves a person. Yes, some people will become addicted to the medication. We can't do, we don't know who is. Yeah. But by the same token, uh, that, that if, 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 if that person is, as a practitioner, recognize it. Okay, certain, how do we recognize it? They lose the medication. The dog got it. They stole it off the train. Mm-hmm. You know, this is a different person than the person that comes in Month by month, get 60, 70, or 90, whatever opiate prescriptions, and they're fine. Yeah. It takes care of people. I need these medications. People need these medications to live. My elderly community, they've been marched to the gas chambers. I don't know how else to get this word out. Or my veteran who served our country and they have they, they they suffered these terrible injuries and they've been. They had to choose between their benzodiazepine or their pain medication. There is nothing wrong with taking pain medication, but it's going to be, I believe, years before we can get the word out. I truly believe we we need 10 senators to come together and and, and acknowledge we've made a terrible mistake. We have doctors in prison. We have Dr. Joel Smithers. He's a young guy. He's got five babies. 40 years, uh, there was no intent to kill people. Uh, you, we also have doctors who were treating patients for addiction. And when they, they were arrested, they went to jail and they weren't given their medication. Right. And, and then they went to prison, they were incarcerated. And then when they came home, they relapsed. Now they right. no longer had that tolerance built up. And the first time they used, they overdosed. And we're saying the government try to, you know, blame these that that type of death on the doctor, but this witch hunt must end. How can 
uh, people reach out to you, other doctors, if they want to share their stories with you? And, and what can we do to help? Well, um, you know, I can I give my email because you can go on the chat. <laughs> That's one way. But yeah. I can give them my email address. It's not a problem. Uh, because I, I, unfortunately, you know, I've written papers down through the years. The first one I wrote was on the pathophysiology, uh, opiate addiction, the pathophysiology of a chronic disease. The problem is I didn't publish it because the only way I could publish it was to put foot, footnotes. And I didn't feel like putting footnotes. Yeah, that's a pain. Um, I would have pain to be behind. But like I said, I used to be a researcher and I've written several patients. I, pro I also talked about a unique perspective on how to treat opiate addiction. Uh, we can empty the prisons with the injectable buprenorphine. Yeah. You know, uh, by the way, that was a study that showed that they have that, you know, you take buprenorphine by uh, pills or strip for a week, then they give you 300 milligrams and next month, 300 milligrams, then they drop it to a maintenance dose of 100. Now, I don't believe in maintenance doses. I think the higher, the better. But in that study, they found that people who had been on heroin required the higher dose in order to prevent cravings. You know, we fit, we continue to fill our prisons up. We were filling our prisons up with young black men for having small amounts of drugs. We're filling up our prisons with doctors who have done nothing wrong. Sometimes I wonder if the, uh, the prison system works in tandem with some of our congressional members. It's just, it, it's insanity. And, and, you know, people who are against opiates will say, well, Claudia, the U.S. prescribes the highest number of opiates. I said, well, we are the richest country in the world. Why wouldn't we treat pain in yeah, this yeah. country? Right. Um, yeah, my, you know, another problem we have, I, my wife uh, fell down the steps since she uh, broke, had problems with both knees and had surgery. And because of her hearing, now my daughter's a psychiatrist, I'm an internist, but because of her hearing about addiction, she was in suffering pain. I had to convince her to yeah. take opiate pain medication for relief. She was so afraid right. of becoming addicted that she yeah. would not. And we know that when you, you, when you take medication, opiate pain, and it relieves your pain, your healing is better. We know that. Yes, yes. I, I now, know. Now, but now all of a sudden, the doctors are, you know, just letting these patients, they're doing total knees, hips, and they're just letting them out with no, no, hardly any pain medication. Of course, they, you're the primary doctor that comes to see you. You're the guy has been taking care of them. You sent them to this doctor. So they hold you responsible, you know, and we're, we're you're, you're caught in a dilemma now when it comes to getting pain medication. We, we really, we continue to advise people to, to cancel all elective procedures. It's, it's draconian what's happening in these hospitals. I don't receive one request a day to advocate. I request, I receive probably 100 every two days from people. Now we're receiving messages from Finland, Australia. Uh, this has turned into a pandemic. Right. We, think either, in Australia, they're trying to pass a law that you cannot take opiate pain medications past 12 months. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So you, you can see how different governments, and, and that's what they're really trying to do with us here in this country. We're not recognizing. it. They started with managed care, you know, which is really nothing but managed costs. And now they're moving it into, into other areas of medicine. Doctors have lost control of, medica of, of medicine. Right. They do not have, you can't control your fees. You can't control your studies you order. You can't control the medication you prescribe. You, you have no control at all. Yeah. And you go to jail when you're helping people. That's right. It, I mean, there's really no upside to prescribing today. And, and to, you know, even for Suboxone doctors, one doctor reached out to me when he was rated uh, a psychiatrist. And when he was rated, he said to the feds, he said, I'm the good guy. And I said, wait, why do you think you're the good guy? Because you only prescribe Suboxone? Does that mean uh, the bad guys are the doctors who treat pain? Mm -hmm. But we are seeing, you know, I think SAMHSA plays a big role in this. SAMHSA, I, I've been told they gave a list of all the Suboxone providers to the feds. So I, I think this was a well thought out plan. Uh, I don't see anything changing under this administration. Uh, Biden hates opiates. Period. His son struggles with addiction. I think just right. the word opiate scares him. Uh, and, you know, the story that you told us about your wife, very common. There's another class of people where my elder, some of my elderly, they are afraid to take 
pain medication. No, no, I don't want to become addicted. Now we have people with cancer suffering. Uh, Dr. Wren, I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your day uh, to be here with me. Thank you for your work. What is the status of your case? Okay. Uh, well, today my lawyer is, is is in court. I'm not there. Didn't have to be there today. And the case is being assigned. Uh, I have agreed to take a plea, agree plea agreement um, uh, only because rather than do 40 years, I'd rather do six months of house arrest. I've already lost my license, of course, my DA license, uh, $2,000 fine, five years probation. And you're 80 years old. And I'm 80 years old. Eight kids. You know? How many and, and grandchildren? I've, I've eight, had eight children, only seven, but I have 26 grandchildren, 13 great grand. I don't believe you're 80. <laughs> see your driver's license when we meet <laughs> I am so sorry this happened to you uh, on behalf of don't punish pain I continue to fight for doctors just like you uh, heartfelt thank you Dr. Wren if you folks want to reach out to Dr. Wren I will provide you with his email address if you are a doctor in the same situation uh, you have my email address you pick up the phone you call me I have a I have a specific place where I have all of my doctors communicating. Thank you, Dr. Ren. Have a Thank wonderful night. Thank you very much. Night. I appreciate you doing that. Take care. Thank you. Uh, my guest today is a doctor who has been targeted by the government for not only treating pain, but for treating addiction. His name is Dr. Walter Wren. He's 80 years old. He looks amazing, eight children, 26 grandchildren. If you are a doctor who's been targeted by the feds uh, and you've done nothing wrong, like most of these doctors have done nothing wrong, please check out this interview. Uh, let me know what your thoughts are. Don't forget, if you like this episode, click like uh, and don't forget to subscribe. And we want to hear what you have to say.